Part 3 Around the Edges Chapter 14 I just want you to know, said a voice in my ear as Quantas Flight 406 popped hook-like out of the water of Monsuno Cumulonibus Cumulonibus Presenting the window passengers with a sudden view of emerald mountains rising almost sheer from a pewter sea, that if it comes to it, you may have all my urine. I turned from the window to give this remark the attention it deserved and found myself staring at the solemn and rested countenance of Alan Sherwin, my friend and temporary traveling companion. It would be incorrect to say that I was surprised to find him sitting beside me because we had met in Sydney by design and boarded the flight together, but there was nonetheless a certain res residual measure of unexpectedness a kind of pinch-me quality in finding him seated there. Ten days earlier in London, where I had stopped on my way back to America from my hike in the Middle East, I had met Alan to discuss some project he had in mind. He is a television producer by profession. We had become friends while working together on a series for British television over the previous couple of years. There, in a pub on the old Brompton Road, I had told him of my experiences in Australia so far and mentioned my plans on the next trip to tackle the formidable desert regions along and at ground level. In order to deepen his admiration for me, I had told him some vivid stories of travelers who had come unstuck in the unforgiving interior. One of these had pertained to an expedition in the 1850s led by a surveyor named Robert Austin, which grew so lost and short of water in the arid wastes beyond Mount Magnet in Western Australia that the members were reduced to drinking their own and the horses, their horses' urine. The story had affected him so powerfully that he had announced at once the intention to accompany me through the most peri perilous parts of the present trip in the role of driver and scout. I had, of course, tried to dissuade him, if only for his own safety, but he would have none of it. Clearly, the story was still much on his mind, judging by his kind offer to keep me in urine. Thank you, I replied now. That's very generous of you. He gave me a nod that had a touch of the regal about it. It's what friends are for, and you may have as much of mine as I can spare. Another regal nod. The plan to which he was now resolutely attached was to accompany me first to northern Queensland where we would relax for a day and amid, amid the fertile shoals of the Great Barrier Reef before setting off in a suitably sturdy vehicle along a bumpy track for Cooktown, a semi-ghost town in the jungle some way north of Keynes. This warm-up adventure completed, we would fly on the Darwin, on to Darwin in the Northern Territory, 
the top end as it is fondly known to Australians. For the thousand mile drive through the scorched red center to Alice Springs and mighty Uluru. Having assisted me through the worst of the perils, the heroic Mr. Shawin would fly back to England from Alice and leave me to continue on through the western deserts on my own. It wasn't that he thought I would be ready for this by then, for he had no confidence whatever in my survival capacities, but that ten days was all he had to spare. For my part, I had no greater confidence in him, but I was glad of the company. You know, I added reassuringly, I don't suppose it will actually be necessary to drink urine on this trip. The infrastructure of the arid regions is much improved since the 1850s. I understand they have Coca-Cola now. Still, the offer is there and much appreciated too. Another exchange of regal nods and then I returned my gaze to the exotic verdure below our waggling wingtip. If you needed convincing that Australia is an exceptional part of the world, then tropical Queensland would be the place to come. Of the 500 or so sites on the planet that qualify for world heritage status, that is a site of global historic, historical or biological significance. Only 13 satisfy all four of UNESCO's criteria for listing and of these special 13 places, four, almost a third, are to be found in Australia. Moreover, two of these, the Great Varia Reef and the wet tropics of Queensland were right here. It is the only place in the world, I believe, where two such consummate environments adjoin. We were lucky to be there at all. They were having a terrible wet season in the north. Cyclone Rona had recently Buzz sold along the coast, causing 300 Australian dollars, 300 million Australian dollars of havoc, and lesser storms had been teasing the region for weeks, disrupting travel. Only the day before, all flights had been cancelled. It was evident from the dips and wobbles of our approach into Keynes that a lot of assertive weather was still about. The view as we came in was of palm trees, golf courses, seaside marinas, some big beachside hotels, and lots and lots of red red roofed house houses poking out of abundant foliage. Weather apart, it all looked very promising. It is remarkable now that when over two million people a year come to the Great Barrier Reef and it is universally esteemed as a treasure, how long it took the tourism industry to discover it. In Ram Jungle, an account of a tour through northern Australia in the 1950s, the historian Alan Moorehead made venturing into northern Queensland sounds like a journey to the headwaters of the of the Orinoco. Orinoco. Then Keynes was a small, muggy coastal outpost, hundreds of miles up a jungle road and occupied mostly by eccentric dropouts of a fugitive, fugitive disposition. 
Today it is a bustling mini metropolis of 60,000 inhabitants indistinguishable from any community of similar size in Australia except for the humidity that falls over you like a hot towel when you emerge from the airport terminal and a certain hail devotion to the tourist dollar. It has become a hugely popular stop off point for backpackers and other young travelers for whom it has a certain reputation for tropical liveliness. On this day, the hall was pressed under an oppressive weight of low gray skies of sort skies of the sort that threatened rain in volume at any moment. We took a cab into town through a long unbecoming sprawl of motels, gas stations and fast food places. Central Keynes was somewhat snugger but it had the feel of a place that had been built only recently in haste. Every second business offered reef cruises or snorkeling expeditions and most of the rest sold t-shirts and postcards. We went first to pick up a rental car. Because I had been hiking in the Middle East, I had left the arrangements to a travel agent and I was mildly surprised to find that the agent had plumped plumped for an obscure local farm, crocodile car hire or something similarly improbable and unpromising, whose office was little more than a bare counter on a side street. The young man in charge had a certain chirpy cockiness that was ineffably irritating but he dealt with the paperwork in a brisk and efficient manner, chattering throughout about the weather. It was the worst wet in 30 years, he told us proudly. Then he led us out to the sidewalk and presented us with a vehicle, an aged Commodore Holden station wagon that seemed to have a decided sag about the axles. What's this? I asked. He leaned toward me and said, as you might, to a dementia sufferer, it's your car. But I asked for a four-wheel drive. He sifted through his paperwork and carefully extracted a fax from the travel agent, which he passed to me. It showed a request for a large, standard, high-polluting car with automatic transmission, an American car in other words, or the nearest local equivalent. I sighed and handed back the paper. Well, do you have a four-wheel drive I can take instead? I asked. Nope, sorry, we only do town cars. But we were going to dry up drive up to Cape York. Oh, you won't get up there in the wet, not even in a four-wheel drive, not at this time of year. They had a hundred centimeters of rain at Cape Tribulations last week. I had no very clear idea what the hundred centimeters was, but it was evident from his tone that it was considerable. You won't get beyond Daintree in anything less than a helicopter. I sighed again. The road to Townsville's being cut off for three days, he added with yet more pride. I looked at him again. Townsville is south of Keynes, in the opposite direction from Cape York. It appeared we were boxed in. So where can we go? I asked. He spread his hands in cheerful irony. Any way you like in Greater Keynes. 
Alan looked at me in the happily brainless way of someone who doesn't realize disaster is afoot, irritating me further. I sighed and hefted my bags. Well, can you point us the way to the Palms Com Palm Com Palm Cove Hotel? I asked. Suddenly, you go back out past the airport to the Cook Highway and take the road north. It's about 20 kilometers up the coast. 20 kilometers? I sputtered. I asked for a hotel in Keynes. He scratched his chin thoughtfully. Well, it's sure not in Keynes. But the road is open? So far. You mean it might flood? Always a possibility. And if it floods, we are stuck in the middle of nowhere? He looked at me with a touch of pity. Mister, you're already in the middle of nowhere. The point was inarguable. Keynes was 1100 miles from Brisbane, its own state capital, and there was nothing in the other directions but ocean, jungle, and desert. But Palm Cove's real nice place, he added. You like it. And he was right. Palm Cove was lovely. Really quite astonishingly, astonishingly so. It was a purpose-built village inserted with some care into a stretch of tropical luxuriance beside a carving bay. On one side of a beachside road stood low-rise hotels and apartments, a few cottages, and a scattering of bars, restaurants, and shops, all discreetly obscured by palms, spreading fronds, fronds and flowering vines, and and on the others on the other was a palm lined walk overlooking a smooth golden beach and the sea. Our hotel was in everything but name, setting and price a motel, but it was friendly and overlooked the sea. We claimed our rooms, then went for a walk along the beach. A few other people were strolling over the sand, but no one was in the water, and for a very good reason. It was the height of the season for box jellyfish, also known in Queensland as marine stingers, or just stingers. By whatever name they go, these little bubbles of wool are not to be trifled with. From October to May, when the jellyfish come inshore to breed, they render the beaches of the tropics useless to humans. It is quite an extraordinary thought when you are standing there looking at it. Before us stood a sweep of bay as serene and inviting as you would find anywhere, and yet there was no environment on earth more likely to offer instant death. So you're telling me, said Alan, for whom all this was new, that if I waded into the water now I would die? In the most wretched and abject agony known to man, I replied. Jesus, he muttered. And don't pick up any of the seashells, I added, stopping him from leaning over to pick up a seashell. I explained to him about cone shells, the venomous creatures that lurk inside some of the handsomest shells, waiting for human hand to sink their vile pinchers into. Seashells will kill you? He said, they've got lethal seashells here. There are more things that will kill you up here than anywhere else in Australia, and that's saying a lot, believe me. I told him about the cassowary, the flightless 
man-sized bird that lives in the rainforest with a razor crawl on each foot with which it can slice you open in a deft and appallingly expansive manner and the green tree snakes that dangle from branches and so blend into the foliage that you don't see them until they are clumped clumped onto a facially facial extreme extremity extremity i mentioned also the small but fearsomely poisonous blue ringed octopus whose care caress is instant death and the elegant but irritable numb ray which moves through the water like a flying carpet discharging 220 volts of electricity into anything that troubles in its progress and the loathsome sluggish stonefish so called because it is indistinguishable from a rock but with the difference that it has 12 spikes on its back that are sharp enough to pierce the sole of a sneaker, injecting the hapless sufferer with a um, toxin bearing a molecular weight of 150,000. And what does that mean exactly? Pain beyond description followed shortly by muscular paralysis, respiratory depression, cardiac palpitations, and a severe disinclination to boogie. You might slightly be discommoded by firefish, which are easier to spot but no less harmful. That's even a jellyfish. There's even a jellyfish called Snooty. You're making this all up, he said, but without conviction. Oh, I'm not. Then I told him about the dreaded saltwater crocodile, which lurks in tropical lagoons, estuaries, and even bays such as this one leaping from the waters from time to time to snatch and devour unsuspecting passers-by. Just by the coast from where we now strolled, a woman named Beryl Ruck had been taken not so long before in a startling manner. Shall I tell you about it? I offered. No. Well, one day, I went on knowing that really he wanted to hear. A group of locals at Daintree got together for a festive pre-Christmas barbie when some of them decided to go for a cooling dip in the Daintree River. The river was known to the home of to be the home of crocodile crocodiles, but none had ever attacked anyone locally. So several of the party scampered down to the water's edges, the water's edge stripped to their underwear and splashed in. Miss Ruck apparently thought better of leaping in, so she merely stepped a foot or so into the water. As she stood there watching the happy frolicking, she idly leaned over and trailed a hand through the water. Just at that instant, the water split in a flash of movement and poor Miss Ruck was gone, never to be seen again. There was no sound, no scream, reported one witness. It was so quick that if you had blinked an eye, you'd have missed the whole thing. That's what the crocodile attack is like. You see, swift, unexpected, extremely irreversible. And you're telling me there are crocodiles here in this water? Alan said. Oh, I don't know whether there are or not, but it's why I'm letting you walk on the inside. Just then, 
from the restive skies, there came a single startling crack of thunder. Abruptly, the wind kicked in, sending the palm trees dancing, and a few fat splats of rain fell. Then the skies opened in a warm but soaking downpour. We hid back to a hotel where we took refuge under the veranda of the beachfront bar, ineffectually wrung out a streaming shirt, steaming shirt, and watched the rain beat down with a tumultuous fury. There was nothing so dainty as raindrops in this. It was just a cubic mass of falling water, filling the world with a fearful pounding din. I had thought that growing up in the American Midwest I was familiar with lively weather, but I am happy to concede that where the elements are concerned, Australia plays in a league of its own. I had never seen anything like it. So let me get this straight, Alan was saying. We can't go to Cook's, Cooktown because we can't get through. We can't swim because the ocean's full of deadly jellyfish, and the road to Cairns might be cut off at any moment. That's about the size of it. He blew out thoughtfully. Might as well have a few beers then. He went off to get some. I took a seat at a small table on the veranda and watched the rain pour down. One of the bar employees came and stood in the doorway. Worst wet in 30 years, he said. I nodded. What's the forecast? Same. I, I nodded bleakly. We were supposed to go be going out to the Great Barrier Reef tomorrow. Oh, you've got no worries there. They don't cancel the reef tours unless it's a hurricane. People go out to the reef in this kind of weather? He nodded. The water in the bay was sloshing around like a bath into which a fat man had just jumped. Why? How much did you pay for your tickets? I had no idea. Everything had been booked as part of a package, but I had the tickets with me and pulled them out of my wallet. A hundred and forty-five dollars each. I squeaked in me misery disbelief. He smiled. He smiled. There you go. He went back in. A moment later, Alan reappeared with the beers, looking unusually dejected. There is a jellyfish called the snooty, he said in wonder. The barman told me. I gave him an apologetic smile. Told you. He stared for some minutes at the rain. On the table, someone had left a copy of a local paper, the Port Douglas and Mossman Gazette. Alan started to move it to get at the ashtray, then something caught his eye. He read for a moment, he read for a minute with increasing absorption, then wordlessly passed the paper to me, tapping the article he wished me to see. It was a small story at the bottom of the front page noting that the dengue fever epidemic in Port Douglas had slowed at last. The article noted that since the epidemic had started, 485 cases had been reported in the area. Although the pace was slowing, this was not grounds for complacency, a spokeswoman for the Tropical Public Health Unit warned. It's at the bottom of the page, he said, his eyes just a trifle wild. That's where we're going tomorrow, I noted with idle interest. 
Do you have any idea what the dengue epidemic would be like in Britain? People would be nailing boards over their windows. Ferries would have people hanging off the sides trying to get out of the country. The police would have to shoot people in the streets to restore order. Here they got 485 cases in a single community and it's two bloody inches on the bottom of the page. Where have you brought me, Bryson? What kind of country is this? Oh, it's a wonderful country, Alan. Yeah, right.